bienvenido, bienvenidas. The Embassy of El Salvador in London has the honor of hosting this public lecture on testimonial narrative as alternative political discourse in El Salvador. La Cachada Teatro, a case study by Luz Cáceres Patón. We greatly appreciate the pleasure of your company this afternoon. To welcome you is now Her Excellency Elizabeth Haig Raymond, Ambassador of El Salvador to the United Kingdom. I hope you will hear me, or uh, should I use the microphone? No, it's okay. Professor Peter Koppelman, Vice Chancellor of the University of London, Dr. Mike Turner, Professor of Latin American Studies at this prestigious university, esteemed members of the diplomatic court, Ms. Luz Cáceres Patton, dear guests. It is inspiring and a true honor for me to be here on the International Women's Day to listen to Luz Cáceres Patton and to learn about the results of her research on contemporary Salvadorian theater. Lifting barriers of communications and opening channels for dialogue are fundamental steps in the process of transforming societies. Creative practices can guarantee inclusive platforms that have the potential to promote tolerance and to engage citizens in a deliberative form of democracy. I personally look forward to hearing Luz exploring her case study on La Cachada Teatro. La Cachada Teatro is a collective formed by five Salvadorian women who use their own personal stories to create a unique set of theater pieces that allows us to learn about the rich foundation that underpins Salvadorian culture and art. My congratulations to Luz for her willingness and dedication to look to El Salvador and its talented women as a source for critical understanding of the links between democracy and culture. My deep gratitude for the generous support of the Institute of Latin American Studies of the University of London for making possible this event, which I'm sure will be of valuable refer reference to other academics and artists in the field. Thank you. On behalf of the Institute of Latin American Studies of the School of Advanced Study of the University of London, Professor Mark Turner is with us. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, and uh, Vice Chancellor. And all of you, I'd um, like to welcome you to uh, the School of Advanced Study and the Institute of Latin American Studies. We're very uh, pleased to be able to host this event. In um, relation with the embassy of El Salvador, um, El Salvador is a is a beautiful and unique place, sitting, of course, uh, quite small on the Pacific coast of Central America. But a tremendous amount of history has moved through El Salvador. Um, really, we can go back almost as far as we want, but the twentieth century has been particularly volatile, and the Salvadorian people have heroically come through um, one of the ugliest periods, really, in, um, in American history uh, in the 20th century. Um, I recall when I was an undergraduate um, in the United States during this period, I was uh, at the, I don't know what the word is, the pleasure or misfortune to be president of the local Salvadoran Solidarity Committee at my university, um, uh, providing refuge for Salvadorian people who were fleeing from uh, a war which was being sponsored by uh, the United States government. Um, and so actually from a quite a young age I was involved in El Salvador. Um, shortly after that I visited El Salvador 
um, things were very tough uh, in those days. I'm talking about, uh, actually my first visit was 1979, 1980, right on the cusp of the, of the Nicaraguan Revolution. Um, so I, I do have some sense of the place. Um, uh, one of my fondest memories was eating tortillas. <laughs> Salvadoran tortillas are the best in the world. Uh, on the side of the road, I was, I was actually hitchhiking from Salvador. So, um, and, and just the incredible friendliness of people in the midst of war. You just you know, offer you a tortilla. <laughs> you know. um, so that was my first encounter with El Salvador. But um, I'm very much looking forward to this talk. And um, um, we'll be um, ready to uh, facilitate any discussion after your after your intervention. So, please. We will now have the opportunity to listen to the fascinating, fascinating research of Luz Cáceres Patón on Salvadorian contemporary theater. Luz Cáceres <coughs> is a language lecturer and researcher at the University of Glasgow. She obtained an undergraduate degree in Spanish and a Master of Research in Humanities from the University of Stirling. She is a PhD candidate in theater studies and applied political philosophy. Her research explores the democratic <laughs> potential of verbatim theater across different political contexts in Mexico, Guatemala, and her country of origin, El Salvador. Luz is currently developing a teaching scholarship project in storytelling and effective responses in second language acquisition for the Hispanic Studies Department of the University of Glasgow. Her research interests include testimonio, verbatim, post-truth politics, non-fiction, deliberative democracy, and Central America. Please take note, we have reserved time uh, after her talk for questions from the public. And uh, we'll ask uh, Luz please to take the place, and Mr. Turner and the ambassador please to take the receipt seats. Which 
cause displacement and the death of over 75,000 Salvadorans and a very deep wound in Salvadoran collective memory that we still have today, in my opinion. Um, so the sense of hope um, was also generalized in academia. We were considered uh, as an emergent uh, democracy, a sort of a representation of the third wave of representative democracy, an example of peace building. Um, and it was, it's an interesting thing to consider um, because it was this whole idea of El Salvador as an emerging democracy that was a successful example of a peace accord uh, became consolidated by the, uh, a peace accord that prioritized political and civil rights, which was a very good thing, a positive thing. We finally got the opportunity to have an opposition in the country, to vote for an opposition in our country, but at the same time, um, the new uh, reforms to our constitution and the new uh, priorities of governments and different political uh, parties and groups neglected economic and social and cultural rights. So by the end of uh, the 1990s and by the mid-1990s as well, the registered deaths by homicide were very similar to or exceeded alarming number of, the alarming number of deaths during the Civil War. And by 2015, we have become one of the most violent countries in the Western Hemisphere. Um, so how do we strengthen this hope for democracy in our country? How do we build from that, from the political and civil rights that we gain from the peace accords? That's the main question that um, for me is quite important to explore. Um, so Ellen Moody is a very interesting American anthropologist who uh, did some work curating post-war stories and testimonials of crime in El Salvador, particularly in San Salvador City. And she argues that the hope of a looming democratization after the armed conflict was weakened as a result of a transition marked by violence limited opportunities for development, going back to the neglect of, uh, of social and economic rights uh, after the, post, after the uh, peace agreements, and a going distrust of the state, which is quite important because that actually means the distrust of politics in general. And she calls this process of dissolution of democracy after the very wonderful 1992 peace accords, democratic disenchantment. And for me, this notion of democratic disenchantment could very possibly contribute to understanding El Salvador's position as the country with the lowest voter turnout in Central America, which we saw last month as well in our most recent elections. So Salazar uh, Araya argues that in the Salvadoran experience, the predominant democracy model promoted in the peace accords is a pluralistic one, which is very, very positive, profoundly influenced by notions of competition, which might be questionable, but still within the logic of a representative democracy. Participation through the representation of preference and a clear division of the private and the public in policy making. So we have a phenomenon of a free market um, perception of elections. Okay? And although there are positive things in this, it can cause certain results that might not be as desirable in terms of democratic participation. So uh, Sonia Wolf is a little bit more radical. She defends that a more accurate manner to measure the intensity of democracy in El Salvador is to analyze it as an electoral authoritarianism, which sounds very strong, I know, but she does make some interesting points because she does talk about the simulation of democracy by guaranteeing relatively transparent elections and freedom of expression while limiting platforms for citizen participation in the public sphere. So yes, we've earned a very trustworthy, at the moment, um, electoral process. Um, however, the citizen participation spaces in the public sphere are still severely limited. Ramos, Lopez, and Quinteros argue that indeed an important weakness of the peace accords is that the constitutional reforms it triggered forced citizens 
to consider political parties as their only legal means of political representation and also their only means for political participation. Um, and even though this seems as a very uh, negative reality at the moment, I think it is important to say, uh, to reaffirm that the political rights that we gain from the peace accords are definitely very important. It's a base, it's important, it's something that we can work from, it's something that we can strengthen. Um, and it's given us an opportunity to at least move on from a very traumatic past. So the question, despite all of this, the question remains, um, how do we strengthen this democratic practice and citizen participation in the public sphere? And it's an important consideration um, in our country if we look at the whole sociopolitical environment at the moment. So there's different answers, and I think that at the moment, some of the most urgent ones have got to do with security and socioeconomic reforms. However, that's not my field, so um, I'm focusing a little bit more on inclusive political communication, a real understanding of what citizen participation is in a representative democracy. How people inform themselves, how people inform their decisions and the role of informal spaces within society. Um, the case of El Salvador is understood in, an, in, a, whole, in a, a fuller way, if we also understand the perception of silence before the war and post-war as well. So this is enchantment with democracy that, we, that I mentioned um, and that is sustained by Moody, by Ellen Moody in her study uh, of crime stories in El Salvador is sustained by social and state violence. Um, there's been government efforts to tackle post-war violence in El Salvador, predominantly represented in soaring gun violence since the early 1990s. I think a lot of us here are quite aware of this. Um, so previous administrations, and this goes beyond political ideology, this has been, it's a generalized situation that we have uh, in our government, whether it's left wing or right wing, it really, in, in the end, is generalized. So we have to focus on just why this is systematic. So these various administrations have focused on repressive mechanisms and increasing militarization to tackle this violence while neglecting fundamental structural issues such as unequal access to education, dignified employment opportunities, and the respect of human rights in some cases. And although security governance and the politics of violence are obviously not within the scope of my work, um, understanding violence and silence, as I mentioned, is an effective tool, as an effective tool that depoliticizes and silences citizens, citizens is fundamental to support the significance of informal spaces. You cannot have a democratic practice where you do not have open spaces for people to speak. It's, it's, it's not ideal. So uh, Mo Hume, who's got a very interesting study on gender and violence and access to water in El Salvador, argues that state terror inflicted through repression and a political economy of exclusion has historically served as an effective <coughs> means of control that legitimizes power, in particular government and political power. This symbolic violence becomes an instrument to silence citizens and to monopolize communication platforms in El Salvador. And as Sonia Wolf argues, it is not possible to claim that El Salvador is a fully functioning democracy if citizens do not have access to diversified sources of information and narratives, stories that can broaden the vision of the world and better inform their decisions. So my central interest, as I mentioned, is the approach to unequal access of information, okay? Access to information and platforms of communication. For me, these are very essential elements for the consolidation of democracy. We have the basis, we have the fundaments to build from, but it's still something that we need to explore. So an inclusive access to these domains, these spaces, has the potential to restore participation in the public sphere and catalyze the configuration of a citizen who is capable of making well-informed and independent decisions at all levels. Okay?
okay, as support. Now that's the only way, but it's a supplement. So something that we have built and something that can be better. So how do we do this? Um, in my opinion, and according to my work, I do believe that the liberation is a key in this, in this situation. Um, I work a lot with the theories from Iris Marion Young, and she considers the liberation to be an inclusive system of communication that indeed diversifies sources of knowledge, which is quite important, as I mentioned, and information society. And this promotes mutual understanding while allowing alternative forms of discourse beyond formality and rationality. So moving from that um, idea of political rights, meaning voting, meaning listening to politicians talking about policy, um, towards a more inclusive understanding of political rights, of political participation, of citizen participation, is really important to manage to consolidate democratic practice in a country like El Salvador. So this obviously includes more unconventional forms of political communication that can be frowned upon by some people, um, some uh, political theorists particularly, such as storytelling, humor as well, rhetoric. Um, and I was very interested in storytelling. So I draw upon Iris Marion Young's uh, model of inclusive political communication, which incorporates historic and historically marginalized voices as a means to challenge this hegemonic or dominant political discourse and prevalent structures of power, of political power in El Salvador. <coughs> and for me, the case study of La Cachada is quite iconic because it's, it represents what can be done with what we've achieved. It represents that there is hope to build these spaces for dialogue in El Salvador, that it is possible, because they have done it. So uh, this women's theater group, I think uh, Her Excellency described their work quite well. For me, it illustrates how Jung's theory of narrative, and more specifically testimony, and self-narrative is an aid in constituting social knowledge that enlarges thought in particularly polarized societies, in, such as El Salvador, unfortunately, at the moment. Um, a lot of critics of the liberative democracy and the deliberation in, in general it always mention how <coughs> external collective deliberation is a bit of a romantic idea. We live in mass societies, we live in very big communities, so it's very difficult to assure that we'll have the spaces to be able to have a dialogue, to open debate. Um, and even more so, it's even more limited in emerging democracies such as El Salvador, Guatemala, or Mexico, where external collective deliberation is particularly restricted by the lack of spaces for public consultation and dialogue in both the informal and informal spheres. And by a political system that circumscribes citizen participation to the promise that the only way to achieve incidents in decision making is through political parties. Um, Gooding, as you see here, argues that speaking and being heard in the informal sphere is indeed feasible, even when the nature of mass societies does not allow genuine conversational exchanges among all the relevant public. So even if we cannot speak person to person, there's other ways of deliberating. Because engaging in deliberation can also be an internal reflexive process. It can also be what you perceive, what you hear, what you look at, what you watch. So good as reflective democracy, or theory of reflective democracy, well, it does constitute, for me, a supporting argument to build a case for the consideration of narratives that allow the imagining of others by making sense of the experience. And in the case of El Salvador, this is key. Understanding each other beyond prejudice, understanding each other beyond, beyond class, listening to each other. And again, the case of La Cachada and other cases in the uh, culture production scene demonstrate that it is possible in El Salvador. So uh, 
my work, which is still in its infancy, by the way, it defends that this empathetic imagining of the other is invaluable for including informative voices that would otherwise be silenced by hegemonic political discourse. So a consideration of such na nature as a good incest inevitably has to contemplate the production, access and distribution of literature, audiovisual productions and performing arts. The performing arts in particular in El Salvador as grounded safe spaces okay, and for internalizing the reality and vision of the world of those who inhabit segments of a society that might be foreign to us. So um, my work studies testimony or storytelling adapted to verbatim theater, which is a form of documentary theater that depicts stories, real stories of real people about current events that affect a community. Through these stories, verbatim theater looks to challenge dominant political discourse and to incorporate voices that have been denied, denied testimonial credibility. By this I mean, even if it's the story of a child uh, from the streets of San Salvador, <coughs> this story has value and it has political value. It has the value to change subjectivities. So uh, I always focus on political context where democratic practice is restricted by epistemic violence, the lack of spaces, where people can be carriers of knowledge, where they can inform others of their own knowledge. Um, and the goal is to evidence how verbatim, in particular, um, provides a platform for these voices to become agents of knowing and truth, with the power to inform and change subjectivities of the audiences. Um, so demonstrating how the aesthetics of verbatim theater create this epistemic trustworthiness vindicates not only verbatim as a form of high art, which can be a, quite a controversial idea as well, but also vindicates the value of people speaking out in informal spaces. So I will say a few um, general ideas and a bit of information about La Cachada. We'll later watch the video because there's a lot of material on YouTube and on different uh, platforms where they can represent themselves and explain what it is that they're doing. But basically, um, La Cachada, the project of La Cachada, um, was born as part of the Women Building Alternatives program coordinated by CINDE. Centros Infantiles de Desarrollo, which stands for Centres, Centres for Child Development. It's an NGO that has been active in the metropolitan area of San Salvador since 1988. So they've been working for a long time already. And normally their main focus is providing support and, and educational opportunities for the children of women who are in vulnerable situations. It can be women who sell stuff in the streets, women who work as uh, maids, it can be women who don't really, who might change jobs depending on the day. So that's what they've been doing since the late 80s, supporting the children that would normally have to go with their mothers to help sell stuff in the city center while they should be in school. But after a few years of working with these kids, they realized that there was definitely a need to work with the women. It's very difficult to change dynamics of violence, dynamics of um, precarity, if you don't change the way the adults perceive the world. Even if you're working with the kids, there has to be some change within the, in the whole family. So they decided to work in empowerment activities. Um, carried out for the women's uh, program that they had. And these, uh, the, the first project that they had was basically a, a performance, performing arts or a performance workshop um, inspired by Augusto Val's uh, Theater of the Oppressed that they called a self-esteem project because they thought that naming it a theater, uh, a theater uh, workshop would be a bit too much and people would not be interested. So that's how they started. They wanted to do something different. They wanted to. They wanted this woman to have a space 
to talk, to look at their lives and to think about um, different ways of living. So they started this uh, self-esteem workshop, which was led by the Salvadoran actress and playwright Eli Larenaga. And the workshop started with 21 participants, all from very impoverished and marginalized communities in San Salvador City, it's in the urban area of El Salvador. And at the beginning, the group faced great difficulties um, and financial strains just to be able to work together for two hours every week. They started with two hours. They had to give up their afternoon shifts, some of them, as housekeepers, or stopping their afternoon sales significantly, significantly earlier represented, obviously represented less earnings. So there was a lot of stress around it, but some women stuck through it until the end, and these are the women of La Cachala. So I'll show you now. The video. That they put together for their crowdfunding. This crowdfunding is from 2017. They were trying to raise funds to uh, come to Europe. And they were invited to the Iberian American Theater Festival, which started in Cadiz. In Cadiz. Mm -hmm. And in that same trip, they decided that they wanted to tour Spain. I had the opportunity to see them in Madrid. And what I had seen in San Salvador City, the reaction of people in San Salvador City um, with their play, If You Had Not Been Born, Si Vos Me Nacido, was very similar to what I saw in Vallecas, in mm -hmm. the out outskirts of Madrid. It's a very similar, very emotional reaction, and it was very, very exciting. So this is their little a crowdfunding video, and hopefully you'll get to know their work a little bit better after watching this. Hmm. Yeah, the sound is, yeah, you see the up. La palabra teatro para, para mí es algo que, o sea, no la conocía. Es más, ir a ver una obra de teatro igual. Nunca había entrado a un teatro. Nunca. Nosotras somos cinco mujeres que vendemos en los mercados y en las calles de San Salvador. Pensábamos que solo para eso servíamos, para vender y para criar a nuestros hijos. Vivíamos el día a día resignadas a que esa iba a ser nuestra vida frustradas, amargadas, sin metas, sin sueños. Pero un día llegó él y nos propuso una locura. Y yo les dije que si querían hacer una obra de teatro de sus vidas, porque yo pensaba que al hablar de ellas, era hablar de muchas mujeres de El Salvador. Yo dije, ay, triste, nosotras, la mujer está loca. ¿Y a quién le va a interesar nuestra vida? Si ni bonita que son. Y lo sorprendente fue que me dijeron que sí. Entonces formamos una compañía a la que pusimos por nombre La Cachada Teatro. Después de varios meses de ensayo, momento duro, medio, hicimos nuestra primera obra, contando nuestra vida, a las personas del sector, y no fue bien. Y nos aplaudían y lloraban, y nos abrazaban, nunca nos habían abrazado, nosotros estábamos bien emocionadas. Y entonces decidimos hacer una segunda obra, un proceso largo de tres años, pero esta obra nos ha marcado porque es la que nos ha llevado a romper los círculos de violencia con nuestra familia. En nuestras obras hablamos de la pobreza, de la maternidad, de los embarazos adolescentes y de los diferentes tipos de violencia que vivimos las mujeres en este país. Esta experiencia de la cachada no solo ha significado un cambio para ellas o para la vida de sus hijos, sino que también aquí en El Salvador ha causado un gran impacto. Nos hemos presentado en teatros profesionales, en escuelas, en universidades, en plazas, hasta en cárcel nos hemos presentado. Hemos ido a la radio, a la televisión, hemos salido en los periódicos y hasta un documental están haciendo de nosotros. Todos estos seis años que llevamos caminando, lo hemos hecho con nuestros propios recursos, con nuestros propios esfuerzos, tiempo. Nunca hemos contado aquí en El Salvador con un financiamiento estable. Hacer teatro en El Salvador cuesta, de pie es difícil, más para nosotros. Queremos seguir, pero sin tu ayuda no lo podemos lograr. Con este dinero queremos hacer tres cosas. Queremos hacer una gira de presentaciones 
de nuestra segunda obra en comunidades como las nuestras que no tienen acceso al teatro. Queremos hacer nuestra tercera obra que tratará sobre los abusos sexuales y en la que también hablaremos sobre nuestras propias experiencias. Y queremos replicar todo lo que hemos aprendido con un grupo de mujeres del mercado que va a haber un taller por un año. Queremos que ellas también tengan una oportunidad para salir adelante. Yo admiro a las mujeres de la cachada por el compromiso que han tenido, por la valentía de contar sus historias, sus historias personales. No es fácil subirse a un escenario y exponer los secretos de la familia, los traumas, los complejos. Y ellas lo han hecho porque creen que tiene sentido contarlo en El Salvador. Las mujeres de la cachada de teatro le han dado una lección al teatro salvadoreño y lo han hecho con Sabiente y Marea. Es que en el teatro me ha dado la posibilidad de soñar. Me ha enseñado que soy una mujer que puedo dar mucho. No solo soy una vendedora, puedo hacer muchas cosas más. El teatro me enseñó a ser libre. Hemos pasado tantas cosas bonitas. A mí me ha ayudado el teatro personalmente. En mi vida, el teatro con, mi, con mis hijos, económicamente. O sea, el todo. Tu principal sueño de la casa de seguir adelante. Crecer, seguir creciendo, no poner los límites. Saber que podemos soñar, que tenemos derecho a soñar también y que podemos alcanzar lo que nos propongamos. El teatro es la cachada de nuestras vidas. Hemos llegado hasta aquí y no queremos parar. Ayúdanos a llegar más lejos. Okay, this is from 2017, um, and as I said, they did manage to uh, go to Spain, and it was very successful. Um, they presented If You Had Not Been Born, which um, is the stories, is their own testimonies, is curated testimonies of motherhood um, and violence in their communities as well as sexual violence and uh, gender violence as well. And what was surprising of this, if you had not been born, of the presentations, at least in San Salvador City, and I'm sure in other departments of El Salvador as well, was the reaction of people. No matter where they went, they went to um, very expensive private schools in El Salvador, they went to hospitals, as they probably mentioned in some of these videos, they went to prisons, uh, women's prisons as well. The reaction was always the same very emotional. Obviously it varied a little bit according to the context, but people listened. It's, it was a safe, grounded space where people, no matter what their background was, were listening to these women. These women who are normally quite invisible in our society. Women that you might see in the streets, that you might see um, cleaning your kitchen, or that you might see helping you do the gardening, but that you never really listened to. And this was an opportunity for them to have a voice in an informal space that's still politically relevant in terms of what they're trying to convey and what they want you to experience and what they want you to understand and get to know. Um, so yeah, this is the first video. And I wanted to show you the second video, which actually brings good news as well because um, as I think it's Wendy who mentions that there's a documentary being made of them. It's finished, now the documentary is finished, it's been edited, it's post-production, it's, it's, it's ready. And they're presenting it in, in a festival, a film festival in Austin, Texas in the States. And luckily yesterday they confirmed that they've uh, been given the opportunity to travel to the States for uh, the premiere of the documentary. So it's really, really good news, and this is the trailer for that um, film. Yeah. 
su secreto, su complejo, su frustrada, y esta parte, va a sentir que ella lo cita. Tú no me gusta, pero yo me considero que, que mi historia, mi historia, yo no la podía contar.
Great, excellent. I, I, uh, I learned a number of things and uh, had a few, uh, a few things that I noted I just wanted to, to raise, perhaps could be talking points. Um, I would like to point to democracy as really being about access to multiple narratives, right, and sources of knowledge. Um, but of course then the problem becomes, uh, in, actually today, in digital age, there's too much knowledge, right? There's access to too much stuff. So on, on the one hand, there's an overload of information and knowledge, and there's all sorts of ways online to express yourself. On the other hand, many of those things are unsatisfying, right? In terms of forming um, the communities, right, that can um, communicate um, their own truth, right, to audiences that are meaningful, right. And so I think you're, you're working in this space, which is increasingly uh, hard to find anywhere. Not Salvador, London, right, uh, right, and, and, and then which, okay, you can have that, but then how do you multiply that. Well, if you multiply it online, it doesn't quite have the same effect. Right? And so you're really in a situation where actually you do have to multiply this practice. Right? And so I, I really see your work as being, as being um, uh, uh, important in that sense. That is, if what you can deliver is, sorry, well, really, really we need to just reproduce this all over the place rather than simply uh, disseminate it. Right, because dissemination in itself is part of the problem. Dissemination of a one case, right? So we go to Seattle and we do this, or we go to Austin, right? But you know, unless it's done in Austin and Seattle by right, little groups, right, it doesn't really mean anything. Right? And so um, that would be sort of my first comment, maybe to have a discussion about sort of what is the scale of democracy, right, in our in our, in our age, um, and how can we think about scale, right, and, and, and use cases like this. And I think this is one place where theater has always intersected with political philosophy. We can go back to Shakespeare, right, or we can, we can come forward to this case, and, in, and always what we're talking about really is a sort of a way to make political philosophy relevant in people's lives, right, and theater has the power to do that. It also has the power not to do that, right? Uh, there's plenty of it, right? as well, and so it becomes sort of a, well, that would be the first point. Um, the other which I really, um, two things that were points made in the trailers by the women, and one was derecho soñar, right? and the other was deseo de vivir, and uh, those two are connected, right, that is the, the right to dream is, um, contingent upon the desire to live. Right? And so if you don't provide that basic desire to live, right, which means material conditions and so on, right, and spaces, then the right to dream, it doesn't matter, it doesn't do anything, it doesn't get you anywhere. Right? Um, and it's that combination that has made these women become something that they were not right, when they started the journey. And so, that also, I think, points to the power of, of, of theater, right, um, in, in doing that. So th those would be my two points that, I, that, that, that sort of struck me. One, a sort of a conversation about the scale of democracy, the other about sort of this, uh, the way it becomes personally meaningful is through this combination of uh, uh, desire to live in. Right.